we're going to start to dive into some of the aspects of designing and executing studies in psychology so that we can begin to look at how we can uh, both diagnose individuals but also then look at collective societal problems and how we can run um, various experiments and surveys in order to get that information. So and we got to start at a real foundational level and talk about the design of any scientific kind of experiment or the scientific process and design. And this should be familiar to you already. Uh, this is just kind of a real brief overview to go through what is commonly called the scientific method. So this five-step process that, again, you're familiar with. The first is you create a hypothesis, and the key here is that it must be a testable hypothesis. And then you design a study that, of course, tests that hypothesis. You collect data from your study. You then analyze the data. You draw conclusions based off the information that you have. And then the last part, and this is kind of maybe a new component, maybe not, is you report the findings uh, to wherever it is that you're reporting to. So we'll just look a little bit more closely at these. So first step is you form a hypothesis. Again, it must be testable. It must be clear. In order for it to be testable and clear, there's kind of two definitions that we use. Uh, the first is what's called the conceptual definition. And in this, researchers use this conceptual definition to say, this is the theory that I'm studying, or this is the issue that I'm studying. This is the concept, the theoretical kind of foundation to what is being studied. So the concept, conceptual, right? And then there's the operational definition. And that is how this theory or issue will be observed or measured. How am I going to observe, measure, calculate this, con this concept? So what's the practical application? What is the operable condition? This is my operable definition. So that's the first thing is you create a hypothesis, you root it in a theory or an issue, and you explain what you're going to do that will kind of make sure that you're observing that. Then you're going to choose what research method you're going to use, and you design a study based off that. And this really all depends on what you're trying to study. So you may need to run experiments. You may need to run case studies. You may ask for people to fill out surveys. You may have to go and just observe people. There's all sorts of ways in, in psychology to gather this information, to set up these research studies. Um, and so you need to pick what's appropriate for the topic that you're covering. Then you have to collect the data from these studies and this is also dependent on what you're studying right so if you're doing natural observations you obviously aren't going to have a ton of numbers you're going to have the recorded observations of the researcher or of what you're researching so there's uh, many ways to collect data questionnaires interviews tests recordings scatter plotting um, charting direct observation there's numbers of ways uh, that you can collect the data. So once you've created this hypothesis and selected how you're going to run the, the experiment, you actually then run it and collect that data. Then, when you're done with that, you analyze that data and you draw conclusions. Um, this conclusion, they have to be supported by the data. You cannot, right, the point of collecting the data is so that you can draw the conclusions. You don't just make them up. And then one of the other things that's really important in psychology is we use a lot of statistics to chart this data, to gather this information. So a basic understanding of statistics is important. Lastly, uh, you report your findings, and that is you in psychology generally as we get into professional psychology, you publish your work into a journal. But it's not just any publishing, it's what we call a peer review journal. And that means that your data goes to other psychologists, they read through your experiment, they read through your study, they make sure it was all kind of on the up and up, and that you did choose the appropriate uh, design, you did run the appropriate studies, you did do the appropriate data collection, and you did draw the appropriate conclusions. So in psychology, you just can't make things up. You have to have data to support it, that data must be transparent, and it must be well defended. It must be a logical conclusion that you make. So we're going to start looking at one way that this research can be done. Again, there are many, but the first we'll look at is an experiment, an experimental research. Um, and experiments are done to kind of understand the cause and effect relationship. Does something cause X to happen? And so uh, in order to run these experiments, 
it's pretty simple that the experimenter changes one variable. That is the cause, right? And then they see how much that changes another variable. That is the effect. So you may say, how much does um, early, let's say K through, or how much does early childhood reading affect students' cognitive abilities? So you would change the level of reading done to the child, that is this cause, and you would measure then, at the end of it, their cognitive abilities, that is the effect. And in order for this to be viable, in order for this to work, you have to hold all the other variables the same. Because let's say we're working with different socioeconomic groups. Let's say we're working with some students who are developmentally disabled and some who are not. You need to keep all the other variables kind of the same so that you can make sure that you get the accurate reading and accurate data. So it's really important in an experiment that you only test one variable. Uh, because otherwise you can get what's called a confounding of variables, where you're not really sure what's causing the outcome, what's causing the effect. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, there are the variables that I already started talking about. First, there's the independent variable, and that's what you can manipulate. So that would be, in my example, how much reading is done to a child, an early childhood development. It's called 0 to 5. Um, then there's the dependent variable. That's what we measure and that is the outcome, their cognitive abilities at a later date, call it 10 years old. Um, and then there's extraneous variables, and that's things other than that independent variable that seems like it could change the dependent variable in a certain way. So that could be amount of time they're in school, that could be different school districts, that could be different reading, that could be different language reading. That could be, is there, are there multiple languages spoken at home? So all of those extraneous variables could have an effect on our dependent variable and we really try to make sure that those all stay the same um, because again you don't want this confounding of variables in research we generally create multiple research groups there's what's known as the experiment group the experimental group and that is the group um, that receives or reacts to the independent variable and then there's a control group that does not receive the independent variable that way you can measure how much of a change we're really experiencing. So if you wanted to measure, um, does adding 20 minutes of reading a day increase students' English proficiency in the third grade? Then you would have a group of students that read 20 extra minutes a day and a group that did not. And the group that did not is your control group. The group that did do the reading is your experimental group. Again, it's important to keep all other things equal so that you can really see is this extra 20 minutes, my experimental group, is that what's really causing the outcome? Or is there some other factor that, that, is, that we're unsure of that's causing things to change? And so the nice thing about creating these two research groups is it allows for these comparisons to be made and for causation to be determined. Uh, because if you didn't have a control group, you're really kind of still floating in the dark to see about causation. In order for an in, in experimental research to be done effectively, um, there's a few things that we should keep in mind. First, we need to target a specific population to study. Okay, so we need to figure out who are we trying to see that this affects, because we can't just say humanity. That's too broad. Uh, it's, it's just too broad, so we need to kind of focus in on it. Um, and then, when you focus in, you need to draw a representative sample of the population. So if we're trying to say how do, um, how does the average American male react to like an increase in um, nicotine levels in the body? Then you need to find a representative sample of the, of the population. So you'd find what percentage of the population is Hispanic, which percentage of the population is Caucasian, which percentage is African American, and you'd get representatives from each of those groups of varying ages so that it seems to represent the whole group that you're studying. Then you, you also may want to do random sampling um, because if you randomize things, you're more likely to get an accurate representation of the community that you're trying to study instead of hand selecting because there will come a time of research bias where you are selecting people that you think will help to prove uh, your point and that's what we call confirmation bias. If you go into it trying to prove a point and then you find a 
certain cases and studies and people that do help you prove your point, well, you didn't really conduct an effective experimental research. You just kind of confirmed what you thought you already knew. Then another good thing that's helpful is when you're assigning uh, subjects to control or experimental groups, it's helpful to do random assignments. This will help to minimize difference in groups. Again, you just randomize it, and the way things probability and statistics work out is you'll end up best. So it's really important to try to make all things equal, to try and have fairness and kind of equality across your groups, and make sure that those groups are representative of who you really are trying to study. And then the last thing that's really important when designing um, an experimental research study is to run a what's called a blind design and ideally a double blind is the most significant but in a single blind study um, subjects don't know if they're the control or the experimental group so they are unsure what they are because again we tend to react a certain way when we know what's expected of us so if subjects know how they're supposed to act or what you're studying they may act a certain way and confirm your hypothesis even though that's not actually true and a double blind study is even better where neither the researcher nor the subject knows which group they're in. This will prevent the researcher from accidentally kind of phrasing questions a little bit differently to get results that they want or uh, using different tones or asking different kind of ways uh, in order to get what they want. So it prevents any accidental bias from the researcher from seeping into the study because it keeps them kind of in the dark and a good way to figure to do this is to use placebos which is kind of um, if you're testing the effectiveness of a drug you would give one group a sugar pill the other group the actual drug and that way no one's really sure what they're taking they can see um, you know they, so that you can see the results of that drug being used so having a double blind study is really effective again it's just another it's another safeguard against accidental research bias so that's kind of the introduction to research and psychology, both looking at it from the up top view of how does this process work and then looking specifically at kind of the benefits to doing an experimental design.